So, ladies and gentlemen, friends, friends of the World Academy, fellows of the World Academy, associate fellows of the World Academy, welcome to the session of day two of the World Academy Conference on uh, uh, the future of education that is dedicated to leadership, educating leaders for a different future. I will co-moderate this session. My name is Donato Kinege Pasili, Vice President of the World Academy. Jonathan Granoff. Jonathan, uh, thank you for being with us today. Uh, and Jonathan is the president of the uh, Security Institute, International Security Institute, that many of you know, uh, besides being a trustee of the World Academy. Um, so the, the, the fellows and, uh, and friends of the Academy that are with us today. So let me start by remembering the words of, um, of John Fitzgerald Kennedy who was saying uh, that leadership and learning are indispensable to one another. So the question that we have to pose ourselves is, are we providing leaders of today with the learning tools, with the learning capacities, with the learning institutions that are required to be an effective leader? And this applies obviously for, to the leaders of today, but, but even more to the leaders of tomorrow. The leaders that uh, are shaping themselves as we speak. We heard that in the previous session. Um, and it's true, it's very well what uh, uh, our, our um, friends and Peter Schlosser in particular said, the fact that when we deal with younger generations, uh, Jan Hans, for sure, this is your case, we are always surprised of how much they are ahead of us. Uh, ahead of us in uh, not just in technical capacities, but in thinking, in this system thinking that is definitely needed. So I would say, I mean, at least for my personal experience, that we can be, uh, uh, we, we can be uh, positive, uh, we can have a positive outlook in terms of the future, uh, because we are surrounded by, uh, by generations, or, or a new generation for sure, of uh, young, skilled uh, individuals, women and men around the world, that can become effective leaders. The problem is, that the system that we have nowadays is still self-centered, is still self-referential, is still a closed system that not, uh, 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 does not allow for young leaders to emerge. Uh, they are trying, they're trying the best, uh, and they do succeed in many cases, but certainly it is an uphill battle. So the question that I think we should pose ourselves is how are we going to help them? How are we going to help them uh, in a society that sometimes does not learn from its own past? Um, maybe some of you remember a, a group, uh, a comedy group, a British comedy group called the Monty Pythons. Uh, they had this uh, surreal, uh, surreal thinking that I loved a lot. And there is a, a sentence that is, uh, Joe, Joe Nurse, yes, nice to have you with us a sentence that uh, has been quoted a lot from them, from one of their sketches. Uh, what have the Romans ever done for us? What have the Romans ever done for us? And, and then the answer was, well, you know, uh, they did uh, sanitation, roads, irrigation, education, well, and all the rest. So in the end, uh, it seemed like the Romans did a lot for us. But a lot of uh, contemporary people tend to forget uh, that there is a lot that we learn from history uh, and a lot of mistakes that we also have been committed in history that should not be repeated. So the question is, uh, can we really learn from the past? This is also very important. Or should we, as, it, uh, as someone says, you know, ignore? You know, the, what the Romans did, what the Greek did, uh, what the ancient cultures provided to us, and just focus on technical skills. This, by the way, has been 
an Italian minister that a few days ago, an Italian minister of uh, emerging technology who had a brilliant idea of saying something like that. Uh, so the, the question I have for you is what do you think? Uh, how again can we help uh, new leaders, young leaders to emerge in this uh, system that uh, is not really viable as it is. And plus, as we heard from previous speakers, uh, we have reached the limit. We have reached the limit of, uh, of uh, um, what we can afford in, in this planet, uh, the boundary limits, uh, as Schlosser said, uh, we went definitely beyond. So it's not a matter really of uh, conserving what we have. Uh, it's a problem of renewing what we have in order to, uh, to make it sustainable or tenable, at least. But, uh, let me start with, uh, so John Hans uh, is a senior uh, high, uh, le high level ed educator, a leader actually in education. Uh, he served as chief academic officers of Somme Education and most recently as academic dean of the European University campuses in Switzerland, Germany and London. Um, currently, he serves as the chair of the International Development Programming Board of the World Humanitarian Forum as, and as a board member of the World Communications Forum at Davos. Thank you so much um, for that uh, introduction, Donato. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, peers, I would like to be known as um, a a human person. And I think there is um, our opportunity. Um, we, th there is a lot of um, alarmist type language that I have heard, um, but I would like to quote Winston Churchill. He said, in every crisis, and I think we all recognize that we are on a crisis of democracy, we are on an international health crisis. We are in a crisis of trust, trust in business, trust in leadership, trust in democracy. We have seen how one individual can wipe his bottom with a constitution. And Winston Churchill said, every crisis brings opportunities and I also would like us to focus on the opportunity that we have to take our leadership roles as educational institutions and to develop more human-centered leadership for tomorrow. And this means that we help to challenge the elitist institutions that we have become based on all these international um, accreditation criteria and how we all have continued to contribute to the so-called homo economicus model, where we are all focusing on people are our greatest asset, but the way that we capture them in our ledgers, in our um, accounting, we actually have all contributed to dehumanizing our common humanity because we then put people as a cost, not as an asset. And if we as educational institutions can rephrase that and we can view people not as units of academic production, but people as truly our greatest asset. And I think leadership and developing leadership based on not a Western perspective, not on an American, an MBA perspective, but on the global excellence that we have across the number of institutions. I think therein lies a massive opportunity. And this is where I would like to commend um, WAAS because they are extremely well placed to become an effective leader in um, coming up with due um, outcomes and to allow us all to, to contribute 
in resetting this global dialogue of how we can develop human-centered leadership. Thank you so much. And back to you, Donato. Thank you, Johannes. Very, very strong point. Well, very well uh, phrased, very well said. Uh, and uh, maybe Jonathan wants to react now to, to this very first uh, intervention. Yeah, a very short reaction. Human-centered uh, would change from teaching the love of things and using people to loving people and using things. And one of the things that we have to realize, a thing, an idea is a thing, an ideology is a thing. These are human creations. Whereas humans are an end in themselves and sacred. And thus, if the principle of loving people and using things would change the whole paradigm. And the other is, uh, if we have a human-centered, then we can come back to recognizing the importance of the very core word of education. Educare means to draw out. And to draw out the human, what makes us human is, a, is, a very, is the first most important question that every one of our educational institutions has to contend with. Because if they remain mainly focused as training institutions, um, we will not be able to keep up with, uh, with, with a balance uh, between human, meeting human needs and the needs of institutions that exploit people with robotics, quantum computing, uh, and the advances in nanotechnology are largely going to change the relationship between labor and people. And if we don't organize our educational institutions to focus on meeting human needs uh, rather than meeting marketplace needs uh, will have enormous disruptions that, that, that will cause greater in, inequities. So I have just boiled down your whole talk to a, a, a motto that I keep in front of myself, love people, use things, never love things and use people. Joanna, Joanna Nurse is the strategic advisor of Interaction Council. Um, and uh, uh, this group is made of 40 former heads of governments. Joanna Nurse scales up collaborative leadership and innovative solutions from pandemics to planetary emergencies. So uh, I know that, uh, Joanna, you have uh, a medical background, a scientific background as well. You work with WHO. Um, tell us what you think. What is your analysis? And if you can somehow address uh, the question that I raised. I mean, how can we help future generations to become better leaders? <laughs> thank you so much for your flexibility. Um, and thank you for inviting me to speak today, speaking on behalf of the, from the context of my role with the Interaction um, Council, which uh, focuses particularly on uh, global security challenges of our time. Um, and I've particularly had the, um, great honour to lead on a number of different areas, including addressing climate change and uh, the current pandemic. Um, and just really to reflect on um, the crisis that we're currently in with the, the pandemic, um, and essentially to argue that this was a disaster waiting to happen. We knew that this was high on the risk register. If we look at the World um, Economic Forum uh, Global Risks Report, the, if you can see it, the red dot um, that's highest in terms of impact and likelihood um, it has been uh, infectious diseases and pandemics, and that's been there for several years. Um, and but our response has been inadequate. We've uh, underfunded our uh, preparedness and public health systems to address um, uh, pandemics, even though we knew that one was going to come. Um, and uh, you know, even um, now, only seventy countries have national plans uh, to address. Um, uh, health security challenges. So um, I think also I just want to kind of uh, reflect some of the comments uh, raised earlier as well. Essentially, we, we see a global crisis in leadership um, and we've relied on specific leaders to pull us out of this pandemic. Uh, so, for example, Winston Churchill managed to sort of 
help garner the kind of um, leadership required, for example, in the Second World War, one could argue. Um, but actually, that's a really high risk strategy to rely on the right leader coming at the right time with the right skills. Um, and actually, in reality, what happens in terms of human reactions and how we're wired in terms of dealing with stress, um, when we're in a panicky situation, we panic. And that's what we've seen unfolding multiple times uh, with our political leaders and also a lot of our public health um, and sort of wider UN multilateral leadership. Um, people have gone into a stress mode, into a panic mode. They've denied, ignored, um, reacted very um, without sort of strategically planning or thinking through uh, the consequences. Um, and you can see what a mess that's got us into. We're two years virtually into the pandemic and we're really nowhere um, to, 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 to leave this place. Um, the countries that have done well essentially have um, been prepared and it's partly because they've actually uh, experienced similar situations. They got They had good preparedness plans and they had uh, strong political leadership that was decisive and um, interestingly put people first rather than the economy first. So I'd, this slide's just really to highlight the perspective of uh, our global security challenges, um, especially from the perspective of heads of government. Um, they've tended to focus back global security around wars and conflict, but actually today we're facing modern um, and multiple challenges, uh, including um, the climate crisis and pandemics. And actually we need leaders that are able to increasingly deal with emergencies and uh, um, crises of this sort. Um, and this is just very quickly to say a, a, um, a global security framework that um, I've prepared uh, with the Interaction Council uh, we met uh, last week and uh, discuss this and and um, uh, Bertie Ahern, the chair of the uh, Interaction Council uh, meeting um, and of the Interaction, Interaction Council really highlighted as well the importance of uh, developing a global strategy or some sort of global response. At the moment we're focused mostly on vaccines, one part of a response that's needed and actually when we're thinking about global leadership and where the gaps are, we, we actually need some sort of plan or way forward through the through this pandemic. Um, but this framework outlines uh, potentially um, the infrastructure that's needed going forward in the future um, so that we're able to uh, respond to future uh, things like health or uh, planetary emergencies, including the climate emergency. And it's really thinking about the infrastructure, um, for example, uh, of the Security Council, of our UN uh, infrastructure, to actually be able to uh, address these sorts of challenges. And I'd particularly like to argue going forward as well, and I'm sorry I won't be able to join you for the rest of the discussion, that we need to um, strengthen our leaders and our young leaders for the future, but we also need to strengthen our governance structures and the infrastructure, um, the architecture of leader, leadership, um, so that we actually create systems that don't allow the, the sort of catastrophic failures that we're experiencing now. So, um, and then I just sort of propose here um, something about how we can think about leadership uh, uh, systems um, to for education to create the sort of leaders that we need for the future, but also the sort of leadership systems as well. Um, so that in terms of the infrastructure, we need strong governance, uh, whether it's policy, legislation, the infrastructure at uh, international and national levels, um, right down to communities and education systems. Um, and really just to argue as well, the case of um, we need to combine uh, science with art. So I've got sort of knowledge and advocacy here. And I think um, having been involved at uh, the coalface uh, in terms of the pandemic response, there's a real gap between uh, translating science in a way that uh, policymakers, politicians and the general public understand. And that is a similar crisis, I think, or a, a gap 
um, in terms of that knowledge translation um, and the ability to give narrative for the climate crisis as well. So I'd really want to uh, emphasize that aspect. Um, and then um, the other aspect as well is in the center I've got here about the sort of essentially the um, sustainable development goal kind of areas in terms of people, peace, prosperity, but particularly with the climate crisis and the priority that that represents for our very own existence, we need to put the planet much more centrally in terms of decision making and decision making processes going forward. Um, and align our education systems to help enable to deliver the sustainable development goals. So capacity, obviously in terms of education systems, but also call to for how we train leaders to deal with emergencies and strengthen resilience. And I'm just moving to the last slide uh, to give some examples from the work that I did in Commonwealth. So this um, on the left hand side is a Commonwealth curriculum framework that covered the 17 SDGs across the life course to create a multi-sector um, life course perspective about essentially aligning um, and modernizing our education systems uh, to actually enable us to deliver the sustainable development goals, which again uh, resonates with the comment earlier about actually we need to think about what do we want education to produce in the future, uh, along with leaders. Um, and then on the right hand side, just to highlight uh, opportunities through um, a digital platform for planet, place and people that um, I, uh, I'm um, taking forward with a group of uh, digital fellows in the Commonwealth Centre uh, for Digital Health. And that's a real opportunity to how we can really scale up education as a common good as well. Thank you. Yeah, Joe, it was a pleasure having you with us because I think that you made your point clear with a, with a, um, with a framework that is certainly logic that stands, that uh, uh, put things in, uh, in the right perspective uh, and that many organizations adopt. Uh, the problem is that the, the framework uh, is there, is who is going to do it, you know, the, and how is they going to do it? Uh, so, the, the, you know, we, in the United Nations, we have very similar, um, very similar models. Uh, the, the problem is that even if you are prepared, uh, the, uh, the disaster strikes. And when disaster strikes, leaders are never equipped. Uh, and, and they don't make people equipped in particular. So this is even worse. Uh, so I think that we have to uh, consider um, really the, the, the as, as John Hans was saying, you know, the, um, the, the people-centered approach, you know, the individual uh, put him at the center of the response and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and therefore equip uh, everybody to, uh, to be an agent of transformation. If, if I can just say, say one last word, I think I, I agree with you. You know, the challenge is that our leaders aren't enabling the systems. So we have to find alternative means. And we, you know, those of us who are in a position to influence need to influence through our own um, processes, you know, whether it's through education, um, or different institutions. I think one of the other key um, bodies that aligns well with education and workforce development is around the, the professional um, bodies and institutions as well. So that, that was really just a, you know, at the end of the day, you just need a, a certain number of influential bodies that can leverage the change that's needed. Um, and we need to think, think very imaginatively and creatively and outside the standard box to actually achieve our goals. And um, yeah, I look forward to hearing the final outcomes as well from this meeting. Thank you. I think the point of strategically uh, strategic institutions that could really change, take for example, financial uh, uh, reporting. Uh, reporting in 10Ks, reporting from central banks and requiring risk an analysis in loans. Presently, reporting requirements are all focused on the human-created financial system, and the planet's health is considered an option. It's an externality. Well, it's as if we were uh, making our mental framework the, the, uh, an, an ontology centered on our imagination. We imagine and then create a financial system. But the natural world, we don't imagine, we don't create, and we have no option but to live in harmony with it. 
So I wanted to, to say, if we change that equation and that reporting requirement, our corporate and, and, and institutions of state would have to change their metrics of success. Presently, because of the mythology that our financial systems are the reality and the natural world is an option, we end up on the wrong bus. We end up privileging institutions that grow at the expense of the natural world. The second point I wanted to make was, I was recently in a public dialogue with Governor Jerry Brown, who was really on the forefront of climate change, as well as nuclear disarmament issues. And I was talking about the paradigm of human security. And he said, no, I want to call it planetary realism, much more in line with the way you framed it. However, the United Nations by General Assembly resolutions has defined exactly the same issue as human security. So I wanted to, uh, I wanted to make sure that Donato and myself and you have a discussion of how to centralize human security, not because I disagree with you, but because that is the language that, has, that emerged out of the world summits of the 1990s, uh, which were an integrated human security agenda. And of course, the thread of the web of life of human endeavor can never be separated from the fabric of the web of life. So to have human security, we have to have security with the natural world. And so the second thing is the other myth, the first myth is the myth of perpetual growth economy in a, in a, in a limited natural world. That myth, is, that myth has to be uh, assailed. And the other myth is that military nationalism can bring security to states and to people. We've now discovered that the more we perfect the weaponry with which we pursue security, the less security we get. So in two instances, we're simply institutionally on the wrong bus and our educational institutions are training people to make the wrong bus go more efficiently and faster. When the problem is, the bus is the bus's destination is wrong, so we have to have the larger discussion of teleology of what's our purpose and what's our definition of success. And 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 I just uh, uh, I want to say how much I respect the work that you're doing in tackling the larger teleological issue. What what is our purpose and bringing galvanizing ideas to do that? And that's exactly what universities need to be rethinking. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both to Joe and, and Jonathan. Uh, next one to speak is Matthew Chodkowski. Matthew, welcome. Uh, Matthew is a joint professor, founding director of the Institute for Post-Industrial Leadership at the University of Indianapolis. And, uh, and uh, currently uh, is teaching and training conducting research uh, on, uh, on the 21st century leadership issues and psychology of change. Uh, he has a program called LEAD, A Journey for Discovery, and that was instrumental in establishing the Institute for Post-Industrial Leadership. Maybe, uh, Matthew, you want to say a word about what is this Post-Industrial Leadership Institute uh, that I'm sure is uh, uh, extremely prestigious, but uh, that I don't, don't know about. So maybe you want to inform also um, fellows of the Academy of the activities of the Institute uh, and address the, uh, the subject of today that is the same, I mean, leadership. I mean, how do you deal with leaders? How do you make leaders uh, empowered to, to, uh, to respond to the challenges, nowadays challenges? Okay, well, thank you, uh, Donato, and uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, also, hello, fellow uh, panelists. So please allow me to read from my notes. This will help me stay on track and also stay on time within the seven-minute uh, period. Uh, my perspective may be uh, more narrow uh, than the other uh, panelists, uh, and uh, within the comments, I'll make a couple of statements about the uh, Institute. <clears throat> Yesterday, I heard Gary make an eloquent and also elegant uh, distinction uh, between thinking and knowing. 
there are in fact three possibilities. Uh, we can think, uh, we can know, and we can think we know. So given the title of our session, I'd like to briefly comment on education and leadership. First on leadership, over 150 years ago, Leo Tolstoy in his epic uh, book, War and Peace, rejected uh, Thomas Carlyle's assertion that the history of the world is but a biography of great men. In so doing, he, along with others like uh, Gustave Le Bon and uh, Isaiah uh, Berlin, debunked the, this convenient myth of the hero leader. The question is, what is the nature of leadership? in this, the new economic era of the 21st century. Today, we distinguish between industrial and post-industrial paradigms of leadership. We are finally freeing ourselves from the gravitational pull of the leader-centric perspective of leadership and coming to understand that the word leadership is not synonymous with the word leader. Leadership is a relationship. Leadership is a social process, a cultural phenomenon. Leadership is being redefined, reconceptualized, and indeed revolutionized to better mirror reality, but not everyone is aware of it. Leadership is the influence relationship between leaders and followers who become collaborators and who intend real significant change based on their mutual purposes. In reality, leadership was never just the leader. Leaders and followers as collaborators both do leadership. This changes everything. Changes everything in terms of how we study leadership and research, uh, leadership in academics, education, and also in development. And since leadership is universal, this has global implications. The next question must be, who are we educating, therefore? And what does education consist of? Globally, billions of dollars are spent annually to educate, develop, and train leaders through academic courses, formal workshops, and seminars, and in-house training programs. Results are poor. Findings pretty much indicate that the outcomes of these types of so-called education do not meet the desired objectives, which takes us to education. It's interesting to note our current educational system contributes to an artificial prolongation of ignorance I don't mean to be gratuitously uh, provocative here, but you might know that in the Middle Ages, uh, children went to university at the age of 12 or 13, and they studied things like grammar, they studied uh, dialectic, they studied uh, rhetoric. What was the purpose of that? Well, uh, grammar was to understand the structure of language. Dialectic was to understand the application of language through logic, even scientific thinking. And then rhetoric, of course, had to do with expressing or how we express uh, our language, how we persuade. It wasn't until those um, elements were learned that the student went on to subjects. Today, students forget what they are taught because they forget, because we as teachers forget to teach students how to learn. Students leave school, they leave college, they leave universities unable to learn, unable to reason. We even see signs of younger people being unable to debate, unable to have dialogue, unable to think think analytically, scientifically, systematically. They go into the world pretty much unarmed intellectually. So education is not only about developing a broader range of competence, 
For example, at, uh, at the Institute, which is the only institute in the world based on the Rostian perspective of the post-industrial paradigm, we are also the smallest, I would uh, think the smallest institute uh, in the world, um, but also education has to do with a deeper level of consciousness. So it's not simply competence, but consciousness. At the Institute, we don't focus on training. We don't focus on the instruction of information. We focus on growth, personal growth and development, the construction of knowledge that leads to wisdom. Students can become more knowledgeable based on their teacher's knowledge, but they cannot become more wise based on their teacher's wisdom. We follow a brain-based approach uh, in our instructional design, focusing on things like um, um, Kolb's uh, learning model, um, action learning, um, uh, reflection, transformational learning. Um, but we also focus on principles, scientific principles. The people that go through our program learn profound principles and a principle is an idea. It's not a behavior. So you don't teach the behavior, you teach the principle. And then we use what's called the three I transformational learning system, which is to internalize ideas at the motive level. In other words, creating the neural circuitry that actually determines how we think and therefore how we behave. Then we have integration, which is the application of internalized principles in a group setting. And then finally, institutionalization of principles throughout, let's say, an organization or a community, which is basically equivalent to culture. In closing, for the human capacity to shape and transform our lives and our world, we must rethink leadership and education. We can no longer cling to an industrial paradigm of a leader in a world quickly moving toward the post-industrial paradigm of leadership. Uh, thank you. Matthew, thank you very much. You certainly are here and uh, your institute, whether it's small or not, uh, certainly is, uh, 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 is purporting, is presenting ideas that uh, stand out, that need a wide public, a wide public uh, of uh, students and, and teachers at the same time. So thank you for being with us and for your uh, very, very valuable contribution. Um, next one, I think would like before giving the floor to Ralph, I think Jon Hans wants to come in to uh, respond also to some of the um, points that Jonathan uh, has raised and probably add something new uh, with regard to what uh, Matthew has just said. Jon Hans. Thank you so much, um, Donato. Um, Matthew actually um, touched on what I wanted to say, but um, allow me just one sentence. Um, what Matthew and what Jonathan were saying is, and I would just like again to say, can we at WAAS use this opportunity, these discussions as an action plan to create and to start to formulate um, that leadership that we're talking about while we integrate almost as the gold standard, uh, the principle of human security as that catalyst of changing direction that we, um, we have heard um, all about these different actors that needs to be involved. But there is another interesting element which we, and, and I think this elitist idea of education is based on what the Romans did, what um, um, X, Y, uh, Z did, and we always quote leaders. I quoted um, Winston Churchill, but Winston Churchill, like the Romans, are dead. They, we live on their legacy, but the, the intellectual and the professional capital that is going to allow us to create this future of leadership that is inspired through moving away from the homo economicus and to move to this human security, not in the sense of security studies, but in giving opportunity for 
everybody. And this is where there is a key role when we look at indigenous knowledge of so many communities, which we remain mute, that we ignore. And I think it's so important that we also use the opportunity to integrate um, so much of that rich experience and practice, specifically when we look at climate change and practices. Um, all of that is going to help us to contribute to this um, as, uh, and to quote Jonathan, to say integrating the principle of human security as a catalyst to um, changing our direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan Hans. Let's keep this round, Jonathan. Let's go directly to Rolf, and then you will have time to sum up things. Uh, Ralph, uh, Ralph, is, uh, Ralph Wolf is a fellow of the World Academy, first of all, and founder of and former president of the Quality Assurance Commons. Uh, Ralph uh, is an academician uh, and uh, is also was also the president of the uh, Accrediting Commission for Senior Colleges and Universities of the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. Um, maybe you, I know that you also work for the George Washington University and other international, Taft University and other universities. Uh, Ralph, maybe you want to come in with your uh, knowledge, with your experience and tell us what is your perception, what is your, um, in, you know, what, what do you think is needed at this very point in time in history? to change things around for better leadership. My, uh, my world has been the world of trying to balance uh, personal leadership development with uh, regulatory reform. And having run an accrediting agency for uh, several to over uh, 200 institutions, over a million students, uh, trying to use the regulatory framework to address issues of leadership development and I, in so doing, I have worked with hundreds of university presidents and board members. I also uh, created uh, a nonprofit called the Institute for Creative Thinking, where I led groups of presidents and provosts. So I'd like to share some of the lessons that we learned from these experiences and apply it to the conversation we've had. Because what I've, uh, I'd like to say that to me, there are the personal development of the leader, as Gandhi said, we must be the change that we want to see in the world. We want to quote someone. And too often we see leaders say one thing, but not to be the change that they would like to see, nor reflect the qualities of leadership that they espouse. Uh, clay feet, if you will. We certainly see it too often in our political leaders. Uh, but let me cite... Um, that today I'm working with the world in which the business model of higher education, at least in the US, is broken. Resources are a key issue. Uh, as Jonathan talked earlier, we not only are driving the bus, but the tires on the bus are losing air as it's being driven. And uh, it's coughing and uh, the engine needs a huge tune-up uh, and so if we want to take that metaphor, I would say that we live in a world of constant pressure and fear on the part of leaders, and particularly presidents, of the inability to lead in this era of change. And we need to support them to develop a new system, but also to reflect it in their own, uh, their own style of leadership. Let me say, to, uh, say there are three buckets that I want to talk about very quickly. Core competencies of the leaders, personal development skills, and structural skills or structural elements. In terms of core competencies, uh, the Quality Assurance Commons has worked on employability skills. And the irony is that to get the first job, we need people who can communicate, problem solve, have cultural competence, and collab be able to collaborate. Those are the qualities of senior leaders as well. I'll cite an example I heard yesterday of a president calling together the entire staff of the university and saying how wonderful his leadership has been. When somebody challenged the data, he called that person in later and said, don't you ever do that again. We have to be open to being challenged 
to the very idea that we do not see whole, uh, that we need other viewpoints in order to move forward. I uh, once called a group of presidents together and asked how many of you have a, an effective, authentic team rather than competing with the different vice presidents and junior vice presidents, not a single president raised their hand. We need a style of leadership that is collaborative, that draws from inside the silos of the university and outside. And I would say that this style of collaboration has to be built on humility. I once had a group of presidents work and talk about what are the masks that they wear and Gary mentioned in uh, one of his uh, presentations about humility. There needs to be humility of being able to be a learner. I asked a group of presidents, how many of you can be a public learner in a world in which there is so much uncertainty? Again, not a single one said I can be vulnerable to express not knowing because people need me to have clarity and certainty about our future direction and the world needs the uh, skill set of navigating this level of uncertainty, the different pressures. So I want to say these core competencies need to be not only taught, but reflected in the leaders. The second area, personal skills, vulnerability, constant learning, and inner development. I think uh, I talk a lot to people about meditation or other ways in which they can balance themselves and to social and emotional intelligence, social awareness. I think Jonathan, you raised the, uh, or one of you raised the issue of, of developing consciousness. And we are talking about more than ego. We're talking about taking and moving institutions uh, I will cite an example where I led a conference of our whole region, all of our universities, and had speakers talk about global climate change and how that was one of the most major issues we needed to address. I tried to get a group of presidents to follow up so that we could develop an accrediting standard to assure externally that institutions would need to demonstrate how they were responding to the global climate change through curriculum, through facility management, through resource management and endowment management and the like. I could not get a single president to work with me. So we had to say that this was not on their forefront. So we have to, it's, uh, that was several years ago, we, we need to find a way to convince uh, presidents that this is where they can step out, whether it's more than just changing the endowment to fossil fuels, but it is holistic. And I think it can be done. And that's where the uh, third bucket for me is external uh, regular uh, support. Uh, one, we need to have uh, commitments and the commitments need to be metric filled, followed by metrics. I'll cite an example. Uh, about eight years ago, 300 presidents cited they were going to improve completion for underserved students. A study was done five years later, fewer than 1% had done anything about it. So we need something more than public commitment to global climate change. We need metrics of accountability and we need a support system. How are others doing it? We need emulation as much as innovation. And I would say that the other issue is we need a safe space for presidents and leaders on their own to be able to share their failures, their inability to make progress in this area and to get support. Uh, I worked with a group to try to provide coaches and mentors to presidents, and it was very difficult. Their boards didn't it, it was a sign of vulnerability to get that support. We need the help of others in sessions like this, but in safe spaces where we can um, share not only what we're doing well and for others to emulate it, but where we need to change. We also need a reward system. Uh, I'll give an example in the California State University system, when presidents salaries were based on improving support for underserved students, we all of a sudden the needle moved because their bonuses 
we're dependent on that. We need a way that presidents and leaders can be held accountable for change, not just expression of words. And I do believe that uh, WAS uh, and the Academy and uh, the consortium, WC, through its junior fellows program, I think we should create an ongoing model, not just something like this conference, but a model that provides sustainable ongoing support, mentoring for an intergenerational development of leadership, but where leaders not only just profess, but to share their own vulnerabilities to the younger generation and how they can lead. And I do agree, uh, Johan, you talked about indigenous knowledge. There is in Northwest Indians a phrase help me see what I don't see so I can see more holistically. And that is what we need in leaders about how do we move from the bus we're on, to use Jonathan's metaphor, to a new bus. And that transition is going to be personal growth and development, intergenerational leadership. But I would also submit, I think we can try to move the needle with regulatory reform and reward systems, and we need to find those so that leaders are held accountable. I think it's a very exciting time with all of this knowledge about what's needed. We need examples of leaders, not the great hero as you described, but we need leaders who are building teams and collaborating and using media and technology and communication to show that paying attention to the earth, to human security, to uh, to environmental justice, which is an important issue, uh, can be addressed and that we can lead in that respect while being vulnerable at the same time. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I just really believe WAS and WC, WC can play an important role in, just as this conference is doing in developing a new generation of leaders. I was saying thank you very much, Rob. Uh, you made a fantastic proposal to have this uh, platform, probably a, a way to communicate among leaders, to, to uh, inspire others, to inspire young people, and to learn from one another. Um, maybe we have really little time left. So Jonathan, you could conclude um, addressing again the, uh, the weaknesses of the present system, the, the system that is so defensive, that is so entrenched, and also, uh, re, uh, you know, with a, a recap of the points that we heard from the other speakers uh, in terms of uh, their proposals, how they see things evolving uh, in, a, in positive terms, and how you see things evolving. Thank you, Jonathan. Go with you. Well, I think there was concordance amongst all of the speakers on changing the focus of education. And I actually think Matthew's emphasis on what would develop a person with wisdom uh, is, you know, is key. Um, it, 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 and one of the characteristics of the capacity to bring wisdom to anything, wisdom will say, let's say wisdom is the, a, a, an, a, a very limited sliver of the definition of wisdom is the ability to identify and bring virtue into practice. Um, and that's part of what education has to provide for leaders. There was a book written in the 1960s by Philip Slater, a psychologist at Yale University called The Pursuit of Loneliness, in which he characterized the qualities that are necessary to, to become the head of an American multinational corporation. And then he analyzed what are the qualities that are needed for someone to grow old and be lonely, to live a life of loneliness and disconnect. And he lined up the qualities to rise in the corporate ladder as the same as the qualities to become lonely. So he posed a complete disconnect between the pursuit of leadership and the pursuit of happiness. And I thought that was really implicit in much of what we were saying today, that leaders have to be integrated people and that leadership has to be grounded in human qualities 
that bring security and happiness. The most dysfunctional institutions we have today, I believe, are exemplified by the $1.9 trillion spent in the pursuit of security through the threat of annihilation. And I look carefully at the educational backgrounds and the methodologies of the people leading those institutions who do it in stealth, without public discourse of the power they have. So if you look at, the, at STRATCOM, the strategic command, which does the strategic planning for the US military, the, the predominant military power on the planet, that came up with the shock and awe uh, catastrophe of Iraq. They all have backgrounds in, from state universities in hard sciences. They all are expert in operational thinking, in thinking that is totally devoted to the measurement of things. So they could tell President Bush, yes, we can win the war in Iraq very easily because we can control transportation, we can control food, we can control communications, but they didn't have any understanding of human beings. That if you invade a country and you bomb them, they're not going to be happy with you. How basic is that? And how basic is it when they still remain the predominant institution that governs our state? So the current budget of the United States, Biden's military budget was just increased by $26 billion with no debate. And that kind of leadership that can be silent and govern and get that kind of money is something we have as, as it leading intellectuals, we have to uncover that. We have to pull away the cover on how decisions are really being made. What are the metrics that are being used? What is the definition of success? And that to me goes to the teleology of, the, of, of education. Is it job training or is it developing human beings? And how do you, and, and, and of course you can't separate productive economics from human beings, but it's not, but productive economics are not the end in themselves. It's the human beings are the end in themselves. When you forget that you end up with technique, the technique of education rather than the purpose. And everybody spoke about purpose. And I thought that was really important, but this is a larger, this is a larger problem of modernity being so fascinated with our human creativity, which has just exploded since the scientific revolution. So we end up with art without beauty, philosophy, art that's about the technique of art, philosophy that's about the technique of philosophy, not the pursuit of truth and beauty, um, religion based on uh, dogma, uh, rights, rituals, and dogma rather than love and transcendence, a financial system not grounded in the production of goods and services, but is creates wealth in the financial system. Uh, uh, medicine without healing, without, without the fullness of healing, just technique. Education without character and the production of weaponry without security because we don't have people thinking about the why. And that of course, I think is part of the value of the World Academy of Arts and Science, that we are a forum in which the discussion of the why is appropriate. And, and so we're not, leaders in, we're not leaders in business. We're not leaders in art per se. We're leaders, we should be leaders in the belief that ideas matter, thought matters, the meaning of things matter. And that's what, and, and so the, the WASP was created by some people who are brilliant at both operations, and thinking, who helped ab absolutely changed society. I mean, Albert Einstein certainly changed society and had a lot to say about the organization of society and values, as did Bertrand Russell, actually. So it's our mandate at WAS to bring about catalytic ideas that can change the direction of these major institutions. And last but not least, I thought one of the things that should not go by us is that so much of the thinking of the leaders of our political institutions is governed by fear. 
And actually, because of the 10K, the quarterly reporting requirements of corporations, um, the fear of market fluctuations governs a great deal of business planning. I've, in, my, in my life, I've been in-house counsel at a public company. So I saw up close how quarterly reporting, which is really fear-based, governs thinking. We're now learning from neuroscience that when we were in a panic mode, we actually think in a different part of our brain than we do when we are in a more reflective mode. It's totally astonishing that what, we, what we're learning recently in neuroscience. And aggressive operational thinking is privileging people in too many of our institutions, whereas reflective, patient, humble, caring, insightful thinking is burdened. And I think it's because it's because we have forgotten the why. So I'm, for, I, I'm, 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 I'm giving it, I'll give you an example. I'm uh, putting together a conference on rethinking security at Stanford. And I'm working with, with some of the most prestigious professors there. And I said, we need to have some neuroscientists in, in this discussion. And everybody said, why? <laughs> and I said, because people think differently in crises and how many people on the National Security Council today have the capacity for reflective thinking? And then, and then I said, let's look at the Cuban Missile Crisis. If you didn't have Ted Sorensen there, we likely would have ended the world because almost everybody else on, was an operational thinker. What do we do? And he stepped back and said, let's look at the whole thing. Let's slow it down. Let's get some time. So um, I think that what came out of this is a mandate for us, uh, uh, Donato, to, to encourage WAS uh, to address leadership in education because uh, there were so many rich ideas that are worth further um, exploration and elucidation. Thank absolutely, you. absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you for your final uh, touches upon an excellent debate. Uh, Jonathan, uh, thanks to Ralph, Jan Hans, and all the others.